Our second look at defenses focuses on different types of defense and what they cost. The type of defense depends on the nature of the environmental hostility. All defenses have costs that are expressed in trade-offs. Defenses may allow disease either because they fail to protect or because their costs are excessive. Costs that are acceptable to evolution may be unacceptable to patients and to physicians. So let's look at the nature of environmental hostility. Some environmental factors are universal. That's they, that means all species encounter them. Food, water, oxygen, temperature, pathogens, those are things that all species uh, have issues with. Others are quite specific to particular organisms, particular predators, particular toxins, low oxygen at high altitude. Those are things that not all species encounter. Natural environments are actually almost never perfect, so some environmental factors are usually suboptimal and some may actually be life-threatening. So hostile factors can be present either continuously, occasionally, or periodically, either at certain times of day or at certain seasons. And these hostile factors that have sufficient impact on fitness will lead to the evolution of specialized defense mechanisms. Some defense mechanisms are universal and others are species specific for these reasons. So here, for example, is one kind of environmental hostility, the smallpox virus. Here are hookworms on intestinal mucosae, a predator, and cold. So those are all different types of factors against which certain kinds of defense have evolved. Now, all defenses have costs. They trade off. They evolve to protect organisms from challenges, including starvation, infection, and predators. The hostile environments select maintenance programs that promote survival at the expense of growth and reproduction up to a point. Specialized defenses are specific maintenance programs. They trade off with growth and reproduction and in general with normal physiological functions. Thus defenses are always operating at some cost. Because defense is essential for reproductive success, they have large benefits, the acceptable cost of defense can be very large because large benefits permit large costs. So if we diagram these ideas, the fitness cost of defense is the cost of the insult plus the cost of the defense. The environmental insult is causing a cost of the insult, then defense ramps up against the insult to try to reduce the cost. It has a cost and that produces a total fitness cost. And because defenses are constrained by their costs, the optimal defense is not the maximal defense. In fact, because of this equation, fitness cost equals cost of insult plus cost of defense, the total cost of the defense can be minimized even when the cost of defense is greater than the cost of the insult. We owe this insight to Randy Nessie. What we have here on the x-axis is some level of defense. On the y-axis, we have a cost. The cost of the insult is shown declining here in red as the level of defense goes up. The cost of defense is seen ramping up linearly here. And we add together the red and the blue lines, we get the green line, which dips down, and it has a minimum right here. And at that point, the cost of the defense is actually more than twice the cost of the insult. So costs of defense are significant, and the optimal defense is not the maximal defense. Costs of defense have a certain structure. Different defenses have several types of cost. The evolutionary costs are measured as negative genetic covariances with non-defensive functions. So that's the usual negative genetic correlation definition of a trade-off. The maintenance costs include defensive organs and tissues, for example, skin, the skull, the rib cage, the lymphatic system. Those are basic capital investments. 
the deployment costs of induced responses involve both energetic and physiological costs. So they, the energetic costs are straightforward. You need a certain number of calories to ramp something up, but the physiological cost is an interference with some other function. Some defense mechanisms, for example, immune responses, have additional costs such as collateral tissue damage, particularly in the case of inflammation. So how can defenses then lead to disease? They can do it in two ways. They can either fail to protect or their cost can be excessive from the point of view of the patient and the physician, not necessarily from the point of view of evolution. Whether a defense cost is excessive depends on the priorities of defense, that is protecting from infection, versus the functions where the cost of defense are paid, for example, respiration or digestion. In particular, a very strong defensive reaction that could protect well against infection might disrupt respiration or digestion. Costs that are acceptable in one environment can be excessive or they can be purely detrimental in other environments. That means that environmental change can shift the cost-benefit ratio and make costs that were acceptable earlier or elsewhere excessive here and now. This is a mismatch issue. So when do costs become unacceptable? Costs that are acceptable from an evolutionary perspective where priority is given to reproductive success are often excessive and unacceptable to patients and physicians. Another way of saying this is that evolution did not design us to be comfortable and happy. It designed us to get genes into the next generation. In other words, costs that were historically evolutionarily acceptable at the population level can now be detrimental or excessive on an individual level. These sorts of costs illustrate the striking conflicts between the interests of conscious individuals and the interests of unconscious genes. Examples include all cases of late life disease whose risk is increased by the anti antagonistic pleiotropic effects of genes that benefit early life survival and reproduction. So the images elicit the early life survival and reproduction and the late life costs. So when do defenses cause disease? The cost of defense can be the main cause of disease symptoms. That's particularly obvious with infectious disease. Immunopathology is damage which is caused by the immune response and it's the most common cause of symptoms during infections. Most symptoms of infectious diseases, fever, anorexia, coughing, diarrhea, are either expressions of defenses or reflect the costs of defense. So fever, and these are cholera feces as examples of symptoms of infection. So when is it safe to treat a symptom that is a defense? If you block a symptom that is a defense, that can temporarily alleviate suffering, but it can also interfere with the defense. Such symptoms include fever, anorexia, coughing, and diarrhea. All of these are reactions that are helping the body to handle the infection. If the costs of defense are excessive, then blocking the symptoms can relieve suffering without negative consequences. That would be the case if the costs are excessive. However, the big question is when is it safe to interfere with symptoms that are defenses that are involved in trade-offs? And that question can only be properly answered by discovering the functions with which the defense is trading off and they may be obscure. So we do not always know the consequences of interfering with fever, anorexia, coughing, and diarrhea. To summarize, environmental hostility is heterogeneous in space and variable in time. Defenses have costs. Because they participate in trade-offs, tweaking them has consequences. Defenses allow disease either through failure to protect or through excessive costs. 
Costs may be evolutionarily acceptable at the population level, but unacceptable to patients and physicians at the individual level. That's a conflict. Some costs of defense can be the main cause of disease symptoms, 